everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, surfs up. Season 3, Episode 45 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami, our review of the Paris NASH Conference, starts now. This week on Surfing the NASH Tsunami. If we as patients can be supported by the industry in order to be able to have those sort of conversations with the payers while we're going through these other processes with the regulators, then I think that that will set us up for more success down the road. While we search for data, these people are dying. We are left with nothing. We can carry on collecting data for the next 10 years, which will take us to 2032. By 2040, we've got a massive problem because obesity is being driven and all of that. So when we talk about finding disease early, we need to do that. We're trying to really build the bridge with other disciplines, learn from them, and move our patients in a direction where we can improve their outcome and we're realizing that, of course, the liver is not there in isolation. We've really got to partner with these disciplines, and I think that was an overarching theme in the, in the meeting, that addressing multiple organ systems is the way forward, and it's through that that we can finally improve our patients' outcome and health. We need to have have these discussions to know whether we be optimistic or not. I think the science gives us great reasons to be optimistic. I think the entrenched structure may be less so, but I like the idea that we're starting at meetings where all that interplay is happening and where we can start to figure out how to take these diverse positions and synthesize them into something that's going to work to the benefit of the patients and others. And one thing that became clear in me in this meeting as ever been before is that this is all about metabolic disease. Last week, leaders of industry and academia gathered in Paris for the 8th annual Paris NASH conference. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Professor Jarn Schottenberg, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guest, Global Liver Institute Vice President of Liver Health Programs Jeff Lazarus, as they review highlights from Paris NASH, right now, on Surfing the NASH Tsunami. It's been a big week in the world, and at least three major events, only one of which, in, in my life, only one of which is related to fatty liver disease. Sadly, we had the uh, passing of Queen Elizabeth II at the end of last week. When I said on the warm-up that I had three major events, you weren't asked which one was about soccer, and the answer is none of them really, except that they didn't play the Premier League last weekend in honor of uh, Queen Elizabeth. And then the second in the last few days has been the counterattack that the Ukrainian army has mounted and the success that they've had so far and some of the implications of that. And then the third, which is what we're we're going to talk about today is Paris NASH Conference, which is, as always, a premier scientific event, and I think a lot of interesting things going on. Louise, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you very much. Nice to see everybody. And good to see you again. And uh, Jorn, welcome back to um, Germany for a day. Thank you. Yes, short stop over here at home and in clinics and ready to move on, but very excited to discuss this with you. When do you fly on to Dublin? Wednesday evening. So you actually have two days at home. I'll get there Wednesday morning, actually. I fly tomorrow evening. And then we have with us our good friend, Jeff McIntyre, who, congratulations on your uh, on your new portfolio and promotion. What is vice president of uh, liver health programs? Is that the title? That is correct. Brand new day. I enjoyed your uh, podium appearance last week, and you're starting by noting you were one week into your new job, so you were going to talk instead about your old job. <laughs> and where are you tonight? Um, I am still in Paris after Paris Nash. I'm in between European meetings here, so I'm very fortunate and blessed to be able to have a couple of days to hang out over the weekend in Paris and a good full day here to catch up on emails and all things uh, liver patients as well. Superb. And just to do a travelogue for next weekend, we will all of us be doing something a little different in terms of transportation at some point next weekend. You aren't flying home on Saturday. I'm flying home on Sunday. Jeff is flying home on Monday. And Louise will be out on the seas taking a sailing course over the weekend. So as a result, when we, uh, this is the team that's reviewing Paris Nash, the team that will be reviewing the Napoli Summit with us next week will be Mazen Nuruddin playing the role of experienced co-host. And then two folks we've not had on this podcast before I'm tremendously excited about, Sven Frank and Hannes Hachstrom. And I think that's going to be a great conversation. 
definition. But let's come back to this one, okay? Just to get started, groundbreaker, real simple. One good thing professional or personal that's happened in the past week. If we don't all talk about Paris Nash, that's probably okay too. Brave one, go first. I can give you a short story from our garden here. It's about the time where the grapes are ripe and we have two big grapes that I uh, harvested over the uh, over the weekend. And now yesterday and even just before getting on, I was cooking some marmalade and filling that up. So that was kind of a evening program, stress, relax event. Now I'm here. Okay. So I know this isn't how it usually goes, but I'm going to go next because off that, I really have to. We live in a small condo, as most of you know, overlooking a body of water with wonderful eastern sun. And I grow herbs and peppers on the deck. My favorite pepper is something called a lemon hot pepper, which makes the best hot pepper jelly I've ever tasted in my life using a recipe that I found three years ago. And we're ready to do that when I've got six lemon peppers that have actually turned yellow on the deck. You aren't the fifth one turned yellow last night. And because I'm flying out tomorrow, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to do a hot lemon pepper jelly tonight. So you and I will both have been in the preserve making business, literally back to back. Very, very cool. So Louise, what are you cooking or Jeff, what are you eating or whatever else you want to talk about? Obviously, we've had um, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, so I won't be detailing a professional or personal highlight this week as we're currently a nation in mourning, officially. The emotions are all impalpable here on that. Sadness, but a new beginning. I was outside Buckingham Palace for three hours, four hours on um, Saturday, and you could feel the change of that move from the sadness and the grief and just the raw side of it. But I've been fortunate enough and had the pleasure to see the Queen on a number of occasions, from horse racing at Ascot, obviously, to the day after my wedding, which was in the Royal Cumberland Lodge, where they negotiated the King's speech. And if, obviously, if it hadn't been for the abdication of Edward VIII, we wouldn't have a Queen. But she will be the only Queen that I will know. Yeah, it's... Yes, um, and, and and sadness and sorrow. Yes. It is sad, but it, it is actually a new beginning. So I'd like to thank her and pay tribute for her devotion to what the UK stands for. Multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. She stood for it and supported everybody at various times. So it is raw, and I'm sure it will get raw or due in the next week. I hear that. She was a role model for all of us. Jeff? Well, let me go a completely different direction. Being blessed to have two meetings in Europe allowed me to have a free weekend in Paris to go explore and do two of my favorite things. And uh, counter to the uh, Premier League being canceled, the French Ligue 1 was not canceled. And so on Saturday, I went to go see Paris Saint-Germain play against Brest and got to see Messi, Mbappe, and Neymar Jr., who seemed to spend a lot of time on the ground, um, <laughs> play, <laughs> which um, gave you haven't seen him before, have you? <laughs> I haven't. Not like that. Although he did score the winning goal. But that's great. Anytime I get a chance to go see the great ones do whatever they are great in, I feel like that's an opportunity not to pass up. And so I feel very lucky to have scored a ticket and got to go in with a good seat for that. And then on Sunday, I spent time at one of my favorite places in the world, which is the Musée Rodin, looking at the collected works of Rodin. And for me, even more of a favorite was his mistress, Camille Claudel, who have several framed posters and Prince of and some of her work and could bore someone at a cocktail party incredibly well rambling on about their history and her work together as well. So two big things, football and a great collection of art at a museum. Fantastic. So with that, why don't we just go into the episode? plan for this episode is really simple. Each of us is going to talk about one thing we found particularly striking. Then we're going to talk a little bit about global takeaways. And then we're going to go back through the agenda. Since two of our panels, Jeff and Yorn, had the opportunity slash privilege to be on panel for the last discussion, I think that probably forces you to think about what you found most striking in the meeting in some way, shape, or form. So I'm going to invite one of you two to go first. I'll just say that Paris Nash is among my um, premier meetings. I've been visiting, I think this is the eighth they said. And I've visited a lot of them, not all. And I think there was some breaks due to COVID too. It has a certain magic to it being a think tank that addresses so many different topics. Some topics are really out of the box. I mean, we've seen a lot of topics that we heard before. So you might have wound up thinking that some sessions didn't bring you all the new information. On the other hand, if you're not deep into the field, I think most aspects that are moving the field now and critical to the field, you'll hear there eventually. It combines basic scientists, clinicians, mostly scientists and physicians, so very little allied health professionals, obviously, as we said, but it also has very prominent regulator appearance. And Jeff was there representing the patients. I think that was the only patient representative, really. The sessions where Frank Anania was invited, I I realized that most of the discussion actually went toward him, and it rephrases how the field is in need for guidance from regulators to find the right way forward and the dialogue with the regulators is needed. So bottom line, I think many different aspects. Currently, the regulatory questions, how do we go 
about moving beyond biopsies and conditional drug approval was for me a very dominant theme that came up in a number of sessions. I think a little dissatisfying answer, but maybe we'll get to that later on. Well, I'm sure we will, because um, that was where I was going to start also. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I think I would only say what Jorn said in different words. I mean, my takeaway from it is that it is a pretty wonderful event. It was fascinating to see, to me, the combination of Arun Sanyal coming from the United States and putting it together with his French colleagues. And so there's this interesting blend of like American and European perspectives that would sometime clash, that would sometime defer, that would sometimes agree and kind of see where that ended up at. And as Jordan mentioned, one of those points was when Frank Anania from the FDA, when the regulators came in and to me took a little bit more of a harder line than I was expecting in terms of clinical trials and the use of biopsy, you know, specifically talking, I think the phrase he used was real world outcomes often in that. It was an interesting conversation. I think, um, as I remarked in the last panel, maybe it's Paris, maybe it's the first time back, but there was just a little more general sense of optimism, or at least there was that lack of sense of doom, if you will, or despair, because we do have a couple of drugs in the pipeline right now that look like they could be poised. They've got good chances for approval, it looks like, and it's not the panacea that I think a lot of people have been talking about. But there is that kind of sense of optimism, and I think that probably flowed over into the conversation about a lot of the excitement around non-invasives, and then to have the regulators come in and basically put a body check onto that was pretty enlightening. And so it was interesting to see kind of the variety of reactions to that across both researchers and industry, and even within industry, phase three versus phase two folks, as well as kind of the whole diagnostic sector also. Really, really interesting conversations. Louise, you want to go next? The one thing that I was surprised at, there was a round table, an industry round table. There was Madrigal with Rebecca Tobe. There was Novo Nordisk, and I don't know the chap's name. There was also Intercept and another company, uh, Inc. or something like that. There was a discussion amongst them about the hard endpoints for currently the FDA and what industry and the trials are centred on. And it was Novo Nordisk that raised the point that if all of your... You collect an awful lot of information in the trials. If your information and your other results support your biopsy and you have overwhelming data, maybe it was time to take this evidence to the FDA to say everything is correlating and to ask the question, we all now have this strength of data, can we look at changing the endpoints? And I know Frank was harder than you probably expected him to be, but maybe we're just getting ahead of ourselves. He was particularly keen on combination therapies of drugs that have actually independently haven't been proven to be effective yet. He was stressing that point, which arguably is correct for the mechanisms, but he was particularly on the safety side. That surprised me. There is a wealth of data in the clinical trials, and Rebecca Torb was also right. They only want to hear what we have, and that is the main outcomes that we have to prove, but also deep diving in that data may produce the evidence that we want. We've discussed it here multiple times, so maybe it's time we nail NIT and places like that. So I thought that was an interesting discussion, and I wasn't expecting it from industry. That's interesting. One of my general takeaways from the meeting, besides the fact that I could probably listen to Scott Friedman read a phone book and learn from what a good job he does of presenting things and how much knowledge he brings to it, was you feel this dynamic tension between the scientific and patient advocate side of the slate on the one hand and the regulatory and payer side of the street on the other. One of the places it comes up, as we're describing now, is on biopsy. I think the same dynamic you're seeing on biopsy is a dynamic that you're going to see on reimbursement, where science says this is all non-communicable metabolic disease. The liver lies at the base of a lot of that. And even if we can't prove exactly what the liver is doing, we can prove it out in terms of a whole bunch of outcomes on other diseases. And you can see the regulators and the payers both coming back and saying, but I've got drugs for each of those other outcomes. What are you giving me? I don't have already. Without taking a look at underlying mechanisms or dynamics, because that's really not what they see themselves as being here to do. Since I believe FDA person, I guess Joe Turner um, and Frank opened the gate at Nashtag wider than people expected. Folks have been running through the width of the aperture they thought they had. And I think Frank kind of narrowed that. But by the way, if you think that was narrowing, stay tuned for what payers are capable of. So I think one of the things this podcast is going to start spending more time on is how to create a common dynamic there. And Jeff, we'll actually want to work with you guys on that because I know that's our real Global Liver Institute mission as well. It is. It is interesting to hear you kind of say it with that chronology, if you will, because I think we're eager to point to Turner coming in to NASHTAG from off of the GLI's externally led patient-focused drug development meeting that we had for them, where 
are non-invasives and kind of the pushback against biopsy or, or kind of this antiquated biopsy that we have now was a real through line in that meeting. I mean, I think in through no design of our own, we just let the patient speak, but we've had the confirmation at NASHTAG and in a separate meeting with Turner as well that he was really kind of began to hear that. We've mentioned at Paris NASH also that the distinction between pushing only for NASH resolution and not just stopping NASH progression was something that kind of figured into that a little bit as well. And if you rely on biopsy every time just to kind of pull back NASH progression and to maintain, if you will, that just can't be scaled. And so it's interesting to see Frank and Ania come in and, as you say, narrow the aperture a little bit more so. And I think that's justifiable where we are right now. But as we mentioned, data will lead the way, but it's going to be the patient storylines that are going to provide a lot of the energy to be able to eventually make this uh, change over. You know, Jeff, I agree with that. Everything I know from what I did in the industry before I started doing this podcast says that energy is more likely to revolve around payers than it is around regulators. That even if regulators require biopsy for approvals, if payers then do not require biopsy for reimbursement, which sounds like a virtually insurmountable wall given how many people are going to need the drugs, then in fact, that will be a hiccup and it will slow us up a little bit. But once drugs are available, will not meaningfully change the scope of progress, maybe just slow the pace up a bit. If payers believe that they're going to require biopsy and are only going to look for regression, then that will have a mammoth impact on what happens. Yeah, I would agree with that. This has got to be a two-part strategy. And I think that particularly points to the power of the patient in this, and not just the power of the patient voice, but the power of a well-organized patient voice, being able to go forward and partner with both industry, to be able to partner with our academics and the KOLs, um, to partner with everybody on this, because otherwise it comes across as this kind of, I don't want to say self-centered necessarily, but it comes across with a much more self-interest on this. But if we as patients can be supported by the industry in order to be able to have those sort of conversations with the payers while we're going through these other processes with the regulators, then I think that that will set us up for more success down the road. With apologies to Jorn and Louise, one more U.S.-centric comment, which is, and I don't know how this plays outside the U.S., but in the past, people have had success looking to employers as a source for good leverage. If you talk about the bad outcomes that are likely to, that are associated with liver disease, a lot of those have to do with work time lost, quality of employment, presenteeism, stuff like that, that employers understand. And payers are less likely to respond to industry or frankly, even to patients than they are to employers or to patients when patients come through the gateway of employers. So I think in the States, at least, Jorn, Louise, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how this is going to play outside the States. But in the States, Jeff, I think employers are going to be a key element in this debate as it emerges. Not at the regulatory level, certainly, but at that what happens when patients actually get treated level. I think you're right. That maybe this is an area for EASL, the International Liver Federation, and to start to get into the work environment. The EASL Lancet report last year did prove that liver disease in all guises is second leading cause of working lives lost. That is an employing problem. Yet I don't know any health and lifestyle and wellness in an employment occupational health, including a health service, that look at people's liver health or assess them. They might do an audit score, but you're not going to show it. They might do these things. We know that 42% of nurses are overweight. We're not great health models in some respect. So we can't get away from those figures. But Fares and and in session one brought in a new dynamic that we're all trying to get NASH resolution and the context of how about opening it up to cardiometabolic outcomes as well as NAFLD and NASH outcomes because most people with NASH and NAFLD die of cardiovascular disease. So if the outcome of your drug is to stabilise NAFLD, not resolve NASH or NAFLD, but to help cardiometabolic health and survival, then you have an outcome that's measurable and that might get approval. So that opens the door. And he was very much on that multi-morbidity pathway and our organ-centric silos stopped the use of good drugs that have already been approved to be tried elsewhere. So it did open up more of those discussions for that, that we maybe got the wrong endpoint. Just before I hang up my soapbox on that, Arun Sanyal was very good when he started his session, The Patient Pathway, that whilst we listen to these meetings and we slap ourselves on the back and we talk a good game, 80 to 85% of people with cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease and 55% in the United Kingdom, I'm sure Jean will tell you what Germany's are, and several other countries get diagnosed too late. That is a failure, as he'd stated, of healthcare. So the FDA, unless we change this,
this, leaves Naffold and Nash, which is the biggest global disease that nobody's ever heard of, with no treatment options, even minor ones, and we continue to see a failure in healthcare because liver cancer and cirrhosis, as was shown in some of the data from the US, Vermal Mishra, is frightening, and they have no outcomes at the moment or options. And then now between Jeff and Louise and the points you raised, Roger, I think it revisits why Paris Nash is a unique meeting, because there's so many aspects of the disease. We had the regulators, we had a cardiologist, and I heard him actually pushing us for endpoints. And this is something Frank Anania mentioned also. So we can learn from other disciplines here. I heard a lot of times that we don't have the surrogate that would substitute for an endpoint to approve a drug quite yet. Even the cardiologist says, you know, we've been looking at LDL or HDL for too long. We really were mandated and happily we did cardiovascular outcome trials, which is, of course, quite a burden for patients and developers. I have to say at a lot of points in the meeting, I heard we need more data or stronger data to link an NIT to an outcome in, in order to substitute for biopsy when we're talking about conditional approval, right? So approval of a drug before an endpoint has been shown. And I mean, that's why we always revisit the bias theme. And I think it came up to a, um, in, in many of these uh, talks over and over again, and uh, the field needs to move forward. I think NAIL NIT, as Louise mentioned, could be one initiative because it's a prospective biomarker study where endpoints will be emerging, but also some of the trials that enroll in compensated cirrhosis patients. And Louise rightfully said there are many patients undiagnosed. We got to get them in trials and monitor for outcomes and link the right markers uh, to be able to predict those outcomes. Uh, I guess that was my look at it again. And apologies for not quite answering your question, Roger. It's just the multifaceted aspects of this meeting that keeps my ideas bouncing between sessions. So good. So now let me ask my question again. How do you think all this plays out in Germany? How much pressure will there be to move to a more metabolic perspective? Where do you think it will come from between regulators, patients, payers, employers, politicians, whomever? So that all depends on EMA. So if EMA approves the drugs in Germany, the question is, what are we going to pay for this as a universal healthcare system? We're not going to pay for the change of a marker, at least not the price that they're asking for. And now here, I think the single most important points that has been accepted as relevant outcome to patients is quality of life. If you're not showing that somebody survives longer, then quality of life becomes incredibly important. And I think patient reported outcomes will be crucial here. And Jeff mentioned one or two aspects, how patients and advocates need to be included at multiple steps on the way. And I think that I can just echo that. It's the only way that we're going to get a drug approved based on surrogates that are not been shown to predict outcome yet with the support of the patient. This might be something in Germany that will be considered in particular if you shouldn't show that the patient's quality of life improves through this. Beyond other things, I'm not convinced that there's going to be a lot of money paid for these drugs. And, and that could mean that maybe they don't get to the market. I mean, we have the same problems as through the EU. The patients are there. It's just the, the approval of the drug by the regulators doesn't mean that it's marketed in Germany and paid uh, for. Interestingly enough, two digressions, but one digression, one comment from the podcast. Over and over again, I keep thinking back to, and Jeff, you might have heard this or you might have been traveling because it's our most recent episode, um, or two episodes ago, uh, the episode where we talked about combination therapy with uh, Mazen and Naeem and the discussion about the LEGEND trial and should uh, the combination for lanafibrinor have been a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2. I, I just hear that all the implications of that question rolling back over and over again, including including in this discussion, right, where the question, if you were taking a purely hepatology point of view, you would know that GLP-1s are demonstrated to have an effect on liver fat. You would know that the big issue with Lanny perceived is weight gain, and therefore GLP-1 is the way to go. If you took a more overall metabolic approach, you would say, well, SGLT-2s drop as much weight or more what you'll gain from Lanny. So you start out where you were and you've got much better cardio, proven cardio renal effects. So th that's number one. And I, I think that the debate over how to think about that is a pivot point. A pivot point, by the way, I think uh, Frank Ganania kind of pushed to the side in terms of what we are and what we aren't willing to think about yet. But a uh, serious pivot point in thinking about how the science is going to evolve and how treatment is going to evolve. Number one. Number two, in our last Rising Tide, which is the diabetes series, which was about use of drugs, one of the comments was about wanting to use Wagovi, which is the 2.4 milligram dose of SEMA for obesity, but never getting it approved. And another panelist saying, well, you might just have to think about giving Ozempic, which is the oral, and you won't get as much weight loss, but it's easier to get the drug approved. So I don't know where those co those compromises are going to play out country by country. And I don't know how much impact that has on what you were trying to do in the first place. So how much are you willing to give up to get an easier approval, but maybe not achieve what you wanted to? That may be a peculiarly American question again. Leaving that. So 
Next topic. Louise, you've touched on four or five of them, so pick any one. I'm not sure any of us have been quite as specific. One particular talk in the meeting or one particular panel that really grabbed your imagination and why? I'm going to jump in because it was one of the sessions that I spoke about before, and it was obviously session one. The conference itself started with a bang, and it really was an interesting session. So we had Vimal Mishra talk about, um, although it really wasn't the patient journey with Nash because it wasn't about patients, it was about the statistics around Nash. Nash and the, the data shows that we are continuing to have a problem. The reason this plays in, and it was important, because if we think about the reverse side of the coin that Jean was on about with data, 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 it does mean that we're going to see 110 to 125% rise in advanced liver disease and mortality by 2040. So while we search for data, these people are dying. We are left with nothing, really. So he was really frightening. And these are US figures. So it was the scale and the level. We can carry on collecting data for the next 10 years, which will take us to 2032. By 2040, we've got a massive problem because obesity is being driven and all of that. So when we talk about finding disease early, we need to do that. Not only did Fayez Zanand talk about the cardiac metabolic factors, he also mentioned that we always look at fibrosis as being an F2 and above being causes of all-cause mortality. He put that into perspective perspective. It's a very minor perspective in all-cause mortality, really. We just focus on the liver side and which part of that fibrosis drives it, which I thought was an interesting aspect. And then I think we had Oksana Daprinka, who did an excellent session on NCD location that Russia do. 18 and above, everybody gets a free health check by the country looking for comorbid systems for NCDs. Now, that would be very easy to add NAFL to because they're looking for type 2 diabetes and they did a screening ECG so you could add a screening fibre scan you assess everybody coming out of adolescence and puberty and then there wasn't a rescreen if there was no problems until they were 45 this is doable but the bit that entertained me was the bit about the lifestyle coach to me that's a nurse in any other language and in any other area we have most of those skills and can be done and when we had the episode the other week we were talking about low hanging fruit use what you've got use it better and these people are skilled these nurses these cardiometabolic these diabetes nurses but I think the other thing I took away from her was the dietary information in patients with NAFLD you only needed to lose 5% body weight that's a far achievable weight loss if you find it early it was NASH that had a better resolution with more than 10% and yes exercise a combination of exercise worked and it was very interesting to see the different diets and how NASH was affected by the majority of certain aspects, but lots of other diets didn't affect all of the other metabolic components. So that whole session for me gave a basis and a format where we can stick in a lot of the other things. We have to do something. Each liver at a time is a, is an outcome for me. And that's what we, what the, obviously I drive early diagnosis and access to those toys, but we have to do something. I agree, Louise. It was a fascinating session. And I agree the projections Homi Razavi did as an update 2040. He said they had much more data to integrate now. Numbers stay the same, they keep on increasing. Right now, their liver disease is more prevalent in terms of HCC, like HBV and Hep C still, but the way this goes up is really troublesome. And additional comments on this session, I share your perception this was uh, special, the integrative care. I would have liked to see a nurse I'm with you there. I think I mentioned that in our session, Jeff, and might be one way forward to really integrate uh, healthcare for these patients. Okay, Jeff, you want something? You go before me. Yeah, um, I'm going to log roll a little bit and just talk about how great I thought our session was that Bjorn and I were in, that it was much more wide ranging than I had anticipated, I think. You know, I'm up there ready to talk about the necessity of the patient involvement in things, but especially when Jeff, we got, did, you, you know, did you prepare a talk too? I, I had like 15 slides sitting on the computer and I didn't get to show them. I did. I regret my time away from other things, from having a no doubt both of our power point presentations would be nominated for Pulitzers by now, um, but uh, <laughs> well, but but it was a bit of a surprise to be thrown into that Socratic dialogue as opposed to the soapbox that we had both prepared for. But it was a good off-the-cuff discussion. 
question, I thought. And as I said, it went to a couple of unexpected places, notably for me, the conversation around cost, which we previewed a little bit in the earlier today talking about the payers versus the regulators and that sort of thing, about how so much of the industry is really focused on, frankly, late stage, about F3, F4, about Nash itself. But as Louise mentioned earlier on, we see cardiovascular disease as having a really high mortality rate for people with fatty liver disease. And it does correlate with Nash, but it also correlates with earlier symptoms of fatty liver disease. And so it, that's kind of a Gordian knot that we have to uncover with the industry. And I think that's another place where the patient voice can be helpful, that people just aren't symptomatic and not aware of it at that point. It was really great to see, and I truly was honored to be the only American other than Dr. Sanyal, but of the panelists, to see that sort of global input, to talk about the experience in South Africa and all the lessons that they've learned in terms of engaging HIV, the Asian experience, which is certainly has a big lifestyle component. And they talk a little bit differently about how they have engaged other non-communicable diseases. And then our friends from Mexico, including the government official that was seated next to me and about how they're engaging it. And we hear a lot of buzz basically going on about Mexico and some of the efforts that they're doing there. And this panel really got a chance for them to shine and talk about the history of some of the work they've done. But we're also, you know, we have now actually a government official on stage other than the FDA talking about how they can move forward in this area. Let me just jump in. I agree, Jeff. I tremendously enjoyed the session. Unfortunately, some people left early. That's always what happens. So we had a smaller crowd in place, but it was a lively discussion. Everybody brought his views. And, you know, I've almost meant to ask you about your experiences from working with White Hat administration around the patient's aspects, because obviously I agree. This is what we need to do. We got to involve politicians. And I even take it one step forward. I'd like to see someone coming out, disclosing his fatty liver disease and taking like a role model to lead us in the political discussion to be able for people to connect and make this priority in diverting health resources to it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. It really speaks to the issue of stigma that we haven't had anybody come out and talk about this. Whereas I've got lots of patient stories, none has really been at that celebrity level. And in most people, as you know, with the stigma of liver disease, still associated with alcohol-related cirrhosis. And it's tough to get people to come out with that. You know, for us, we're Working with the White House was playing to kind of the strengths that I think I have and the trajectory of my career has brought me to, which was previously working in food politics and in working in physical inactivity as part of the Obama White House's Task Force on Childhood Obesity. And so it's almost like where I am now has arrived at the disease state from so much of the social factors that have played out previously on this. And so when we got into discussions about that there was going to be a White House conference on nutrition, you know, originally those discussions were nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. And then we slowly saw the agenda and the conversation through the listening sessions begin to really rotate much more around their priorities, which were going to be mostly sustainability and supply chain. And those are big things. I mean, arguably, sustainability and climate change should be a through line through every discussion everywhere. I don't disagree with that. Supply chain is big on people's minds coming out of the pandemic. There's been a lot of difficulties with that as well. But when you isolate those, in terms of the food issues, it really becomes then about can we find a place to be able to sustain more food and then provide it to those that are in need. And it really says nothing about the type of food. It says nothing about inequities in food. At that point, it essentially becomes a conference on calories, if you will, and less a conference on nutrition as it might be able to treat a clinical or critical disease of some sort. And so we just started pushing. You know, we had folks within the industry. We had folks that were in startups. There were folks in pharma that actually we had great conversations with as well that all believed in this message. And fortunately, we were able to push in a way to be able to get it mentioned several times in the White House conference report. We're still waiting to see how the agenda comes, but this is part of what's important is we've got to be able to carry the small stories, the patients, be able to build them up as advocates before their doctor and before the FDA, but at the same time, be able to encourage people to work at a higher level, that this is an international issue that we all see coming and to be able to engage it at both the White House and the backyard. And so to a certain extent, I'd like to say we were lucky that we got it in there, but we had the right time, right place to be able to raise the voice for the White House. And we anticipate, you know, we're not going to let our, our, our foot off the pedal with this. We're going to keep pushing forward for more recognition in these places. And eventually we're going to get somebody that's going to come around. Somebody, unfortunately, just the way the statistics are, it's going to happen where somebody will have NASH and have issues from that and will begin to speak out about it. But hopefully it's going 
going to be a voice that can be heard and will be respected and related to worldwide. Chef, three thoughts, two related to this conversation and one my answer to my original question. Here's the first one. Back in the 80s, when I was doing political polling, I had two clients who were members of Congress who were also members of something called the Zipper Caucus, which nobody knew about. And the Zipper Caucus, interestingly named, was for people who had open heart surgery. They never went public, but they all knew who they were. They all got together for lunch once a month. In fact, some of them prayed together whenever anybody else was out to have surgery. You found people who prayed for them. And the net result was that anybody working in heart disease knew that that was a group of people you could go to. They were bipartisan. And I don't believe that any of them, to the best of my knowledge, made a point publicly saying, hey, I've had quadruple bypass, I've had pacemaker, I've had any of that. But they they all knew. Now, that was a different point in time. Congress was a lot more functional then than it is now. In fact, uh, one of my Democratic clients asked me if I would do polling for a Republican friend of his who we met through the Zipper Club. I don't think you see that a lot in 2022. But my point is that in Washington, at least, there are, things can move in ways that are quieter than in the world of public celebrity advocacy, number one. Number two, completely different point. I suspect that we will not have as much success going after F1 and F0 by getting people to do drug studies that have outcomes attached to them because it's going to take forever to get to those outcomes, even if you measure surrogate endpoints. However, if we do a good enough job of educating physicians and other healthcare professionals about the nature of metabolic disease, and they come to an understanding that a lot of these drugs are going to work in more than one situation, fade back to the conversation that I shared about Wagovi and Ozempic, and now roll into that the dual and the triple agonist for obesity and all the things we're learning about SGLT2s. And we get to a place where a drug might not need to have a NASH approval if we've done a good enough job of educating the profession of how all these pieces fit together. I think that's a much more practical strategy, frankly, than waiting to get drugs approved for F1 Nash or for NAFL, period. I'm just going to jump in on that because I think that was also that something that Fares Anand was talking about. He mentioned the fact that we all think our organs are the result of the injury from the other organs. So we always look at it as an organ-centric disease. And I think his phrase was, which was a beautiful phrase, our organs aren't necessarily the victims. They're all the victims of a set of risk factors. That's very much the way we should be looking at it. That brings in this whole AI back reading, looking at all of the common risk factors and then assessing for every disease and putting in that plethora of tests. So you get your ECD, you get fibro scan, you get your whatever, you get your FIBO or ELF and you do that through and you assess for which set of fibrosis because he talked about fibrosis being more or less equal, every organ fibrosis. What also interested me and I thought was a very good session was surreal um, causes one about the diabetes populations, the five categories and you can pick out which one are going to get kidney failure and heart disease and they all have NAFL. It's those now real subpopulations that we can pick out that means we can target better. So yes, it was a great conference for looking at things like that. Still, we cannot diagnose if we can't get a routine screening despite the rate of increase we're struggling. I don't disagree and I didn't mean to convey anything to the fact that we weren't. I was simply asking, do you try to climb the 30-foot wall or the 6-foot wall? And even if after you climb the 6-foot foot wall, you've got three more six foot walls to climb to get to where you wanted to get to in the first place. It's probably easier to do it that way. And that was really the entire extent of, of that point. My third point, and this was my answer to my own question. We've talked about Frank Anania's talk, but we didn't talk about the rest of session five, which I thought was fantastic because what session five took a look at was organizing to think creatively about better ways to do the important things we have to do in clinical trials. Roy Sabos, I've always understood at a 30,000 foot level what that adaptive as a concept was a good idea, but I didn't really understand uh, uh, what they were talking about until Roy Sapo walked us through all that. And I thought that that was amazing and very, very clear. I mean, Stephen had talked about a month ago about uh, taking fiber scan reads midpoint and using that to reset an, an entry criterion. But this is a whole different level. And I think that the wizardry of, I'm, I'm a big fan of Bayesian statistics, the wizardry of Bayesian statistics strikes again. But so I thought that was excellent. The talk after that was the fellow from Mexico about how we're organizing things in Mexico that I thought was really fantastic, Jeff, and in terms of organizing around trial populations and how to get people more um, coherent to do that. And then the last talk was Marcus Homespeck, I think is his name, from Prociento. I've been looking at Prociento for two years, ever since they started raising money, as a really interesting model of how to attack clinical trial more systematically. Louise and I were texting during his talk trying to figure out exactly how far they're bringing the screen fail rate down, but it's a big number. And they're doing that by taking, I think, a, a much more holistic approach to what they're doing. You're on the kind of thing you've been advocating for in recent episodes, and uh, you and Nail and IT and all that are kind of pushing towards as well. But I became imbued 
with hope that we can start doing trials much smarter, even than we envision today as we look ahead. Session five was good. Um, as a clinician, you're always a little bit intimidated by a statistician who gives you a lot of formulas and you were really trying to wrap your head around it. A lot of people felt a little bit overwhelmed by the formulas he presented. I forgot you're a statistician yourself, Roger, so you felt very comfortable with the formulas, but I could follow him at least as words and for sure the adaptation and being able to shorten or change the trial or enrich its power is clearly something we have to do in, in such a disease where we don't have an approved therapy and then submitting people to potentially an effective or highly effective treatments to shorten treatment duration. But coming to uh, Markus Hompesch, and it's a German name, so I would call it Hompesch. Thank you. For those who don't know, you aren't teaches me European names from time to time, but I completely foul up. So this is the first time I believe we've ever done this in public. Yeah, sorry for that, Roger. <laughs> no, 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 don't be. Please, I need to learn. It's and Mark is, um, uh, we had an exchange in German, so I'm pretty confident that's all. You know, the question I had is, uh, and I asked him that, is of course, it's it's good to enroll the patients, but it changes things for the good. I mean, um, patients are going to reflect about their condition. Potentially, those programs also provide something, access to either healthcare or educational materials. So there is going to be, maybe we're gonna, even going to be able to shape up some of the placebo effects that are normally then just start at the beginning of a clinical trial. And as such, I believe that these type of programs that enrich patients, keep them at bay to be enrolled once the right trial comes along is a good way also to decrease placebo effects. Yeah, I think these are all enrichment strategies. And Bayesian priors as kind of not cutting edge, but certainly state-of-the-art statistics go. Bayesian priors are a place to look for enrichment strategies without going into any details beyond that for now. Jeff, you wanted to say something on that? Yeah, I mean, it points again more towards patient involvement. And I feel like I'm, I'm becoming a little bit of the, the, the annoying parrot on the shoulder that only has the one phrase that he comes back with all the time, but it seems to me that this points to this. I, I fear that in many of our how do we improve clinical trials conversations, you know, we talk about screen failure rates and other aspects of it, so often there is technological response of some sort, that if we can do this, if we can integrate AI, if we can integrate a different aspect of technology, that it will help incorporate that. And I think that I rank technology probably down at about seven or eight, actually, of what I would consider priorities in terms of being able to recruit better and to get better results in clinical trials as well. There are huge inequities in the system. There are biases in how things are chosen. There's just a, t a ton of other places that we can probably do that. And I think with patient input earlier on, it's going to help with that. I mean, even in the area of, frankly, something that wasn't discussed at Paris Nash, but informed consent, you know, that plays with the notion of education to begin with. But there's a lot of work to do that will happen outside of the labs to be able to include to improve clinical trials. If I'm being defensive, forgive me. I don't disagree with anything you just said. I think there's a question of getting the right population in where we are woefully deficient right now. And then there's a question of taking the population that's in and enriching it to the best end in terms of results. And in terms of enrichment, I think statistics has a lot to offer. In terms of getting the right patients in, I completely agree with you. And if you start with a population that's too narrow and you enrich it, which is the easiest thing to do, we're still going to wind up looking people in the eye in 15 years and saying, well, we haven't done any work with your particular ethnic group of trusted. That's unqualifiedly bad. On the other hand, getting in populations that are appropriately diverse and then not understanding how to take advantage of the differences between them will produce trials that are inefficient as well. So you're right. If I had to pick one, I think I worry about the one that you're worrying about. Happily, I don't think we have to make that choice. I think we can get the different people to go down both paths and make the whole thing work better. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you know, not to be trite, but something's better than nothing. And if we're not maximizing those that are coming into the trials now, then we're not going to have a foundation when we try to expand as well. We have a little bit of time left. I thought maybe we would just take the program and go session through session and see if anybody had anything they wanted to comment on that we've not touched on yet. Let's start in session one, right? Which where certainly Louise has talked significantly and actually we've talked about all that a little bit, haven't we? Is there anything anybody would like to add on the uh, any of the uh, discussion around session one? Something that stuck with me was that colleague, uh, Sanat from Friends, uh, motivated us to look at outcome trials and look at different indications. And I think this is uh, something that the field needs to be uh, discussing. Okay, session two. Well, actually, we haven't said anything about Chris's paper, have we? We haven't, but I would like to start with Cyril Cossey. She highlighted different types of insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes in patients with NAFLD and painting just two subclasses. Ones with severe insulin resistance that over time develop NAFLD and those with insulin and those with NAFLD that have some insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes, but maybe not the worst one. And I thought a very pragmatic and simple way to look at them. One or the other. And I thought that the treatment of these two types of diabetes are going to be very different. And actually, that was one of the questions that came from 
from the audience too. I think we're not equally paying attention to the length of the diabetes or the quality of the control. And I think we're seeing subgroups here. Spoiler alert, Jorn, which is that if she's in Dublin, I intend to beeline her and ask her to come do an episode on that because I thought Louise and I both agreed as we were listening how fascinating it was. And if we can get her into the diabetes series also, that would be fantastic for the same reason. I agree. I thought that was remarkably good and clear data. In the endocrinology literature, there are some more subtypes. A Lancet endocrinology paper described five subtypes with different organ manifestations. So I think there's more complexity to that. She did it very pragmatic. Maybe it will be great to have her in an episode and, and detail it. But I did enjoy Chris Cowdery's session that was the first one. His point was, was when we do randomized controlled trials, we get in a population that doesn't reflect the real world trials, which one's heterogeneous and one's homogeneous and all of the problems that go on that sort of problem. Therein lies part of the issue of where we stand currently. We can have a perfect drug for a perfect heterogeneous patient in a trial that doesn't work in the real world. And I think, let's see. So he was talking about multiple different markers and how you do that. And I thought that was interesting. I thought Chris is a great choice for that paper. You know, he's been doing stuff for a long, long time and he's not solely about fatty liver. He looks more broadly at liver disease. And I think the more broadly you look, the more you can appreciate the shortfalls that you run into by focusing too narrowly. And I thought he did a great job of summing that stuff up. Louise, I think you were the one who had pointed up before we got started the HIV paper. And I don't know, was that when you stepped out or were you, or, or did no, you No, I, I caught, I caught some of that, but not enough to really be able to comment more than there was a general feel that a lot of people are now with the HIV and Jean is far more qualified to do this with his studies is that now they gain weight the same as anybody else. And there was one argument that most of their NAFLD was related to their weight gain and the normal parts of life they now have. That was the only bit that I was able to catch from that session. Do you have any reactions? I know, obviously, as Louise pointed out, and we've all discussed, you do a bunch of work in this area. They linked some risk factors that are present, medications, viral aspects, CD4 count uh, to these manifestations. Something that's always very striking to me is that in general, this population is a little bit younger, but the metabolic burden is the same. I think one of the reasons why they're so studied intensively is because they tend to show up in clinic regularly, and it's particularly uh, easy to enroll them in such a preventive strategy to inform them about their health and then to do it more globally because it's a population of chronically diseased or chronically infected humans. As such, um, we spend a lot of time with them and counseling them. Metabolic liver health is just one aspect of that too. Moving onward as this clock moves on as well, Scott Friedman's session, I just thought fantastic, but go ahead. A very special session. He always complains that he hasn't had that talk when he starts it. It feels like, you know, he's been thinking about that for some long time and the diversity of the methods and the papers he presented was just great. It's stimulating and he highlighted some of the technologies that we also discussed in this podcast, single cell sequencing, repeatedly said that this was uh, the most powerful technology advancement he's seen recently. And I think we're going to see many more great uh, discoveries from that. He's been clear about that. He's been clear about his fit. So in my old career, every once in a while, I got asked to give a paper about something I didn't know anything about. And not so different. I think what you realize, A, is that everything you know ties into everything you need to study more than you would have realized when you get started. And it winds up shaping the perspective that you bring to the talk. I, I think, as I said, I could watch him read a phone book because I'm sure he would manage to bring all his experience to it. But this was an example of that. Jeff, you look like you want to say something. Do I have you wrong? Dr. Friedman's, you know, session was interesting. As you marked earlier, I'm in this new position now and am learning much more about HCC as I now oversee, see if I'm throwing how many letters I'm throwing at you, GLI's liver cancer program. And it's it's interesting to make the connections there to see where the outcomes are, but also see where there are some dissimilarities as well. Just a, a good basic overview, you know, for me of that. So, so stepping into this role, was there any particular point he made that struck you or was it just kind of in general it was quite um, impressive and enveloping? Yeah, that it's just, it's it's impressive and that there's still co- quite a long way to go with it. FNIH, I'll let somebody else comment on that first. I learned a lot. I guess I had expected it might go a little deeper than it went, a little more about here's what we're doing and a little bit less about here's what we're learning. But maybe it's premature for that. And I was encouraged by the programs. I would agree with that, Roger. It's an open secret that, you know, the Liver Forum did its meeting the day before Paris Nash and where we got a preview of a lot of these topics as well. And I'll mention, I think I can mention, I'll find out, I guess, that, you know, Frank Anania was a part of those discussions as well. And I feel like that, as we said earlier, really kind of steered a lot of the talk and a 
lot of the reaction we had to this. And so it was nice to see this, the FNIH presentations occur kind of outside of that perspective, kind of being a part of it. Second warning, anything about either the Madrigal Symposium or the industry corner beyond the one comment that Louise has already shared? Well, I think it's important that the industry sponsors are there and are engaging. It's the opportunity to be in touch and to hear more about their programs is always encouraging. Now, this is not new data they're presenting there, but they're reflecting about the drug development programs. It's there for completeness and and good to, um, you know, link to the respective people, but it's not the most exciting new data part of the meetings, I guess. No, but I think there was something of interest in there. They were talking about estrogen, and I think it was William Alawazi who stepped up to the mic to ask about estrogen afterwards. And in fact, I can't remember who the chap was who was talking about that they've modelled in mice and also in women and women because of course we develop NASH and fatty liver disease quicker after menopause actually did say that if you then give it estrogen replacement it actually slows down and stops that progression so that for me raises the argument of why are we not screening women as they go through menopause for fatty liver disease if we now know and can prove that by giving them estrogen supplements we can actually prevent that so we have a preventative option for something we could screen for and we don't do it. So that did raise a few issues to me, both in mouse models and in female subjects. So it is the fastest growing reason for liver transplantation post-menopause. And yet that general discussion was, oh yeah, we can do this. And yeah, we've shown it works. (laughs) Slap me on the back of the head, but (laughs) there's an opportunity to help women's health. I think estrogen is a little politically fraught and not for the reason you're thinking. Back in the 90s, it was claimed that estrogen was the solution to everything. In fact, a massively funded program called the Women's Health Initiative looked at estrogen for everything. And it wound up turning out that A, it didn't do all the, couldn't be proven to do all the good things people thought it could do. And then B, it was more carcinogenic than people had realized. And before that, uh, Premarin, had been growing as fast as any drug that was five years old or older in the U.S. market and in many of the other world markets. And that just completely blunted it because people were afraid of unintended consequences. So I, I think that's part of what gets in the way here. And I, I know the regulators would break out in hives if they had to approach new indications uh, for estrogen, given what that experience did. I'm guessing they break out in hives. They might have a less severe, but certainly physiological reaction. Absolutely. But I think we can tailor it a little bit better now. Um, and uh, there was agree. an awful lot of stuff on micro gut microbiome that I enjoyed but we need to be targeting menopausal health. Okay, we're getting to the end. I want one more comment and then final wrap-up question. Arun Science Lecture. You were you had said you were looking forward to it because you thought it would be one thing. I think it was something different than what you described anticipating. Uh, how'd you feel about it? Yeah, he, he gave an overview on the future of clinical management a little bit, I guess, and NIT use. I had expected more of a forward-looking statement, but many of these were already touched during the discussions that were with uh, Frank Canania. And as such, it was, he gave a very strong overview. It, it wasn't too many new aspects for me. I shouldn't say uh, this was um, disappointing. It was clearly something, state of the art information on where the field moves. But from my perspective, the sessions around it had more aspects that were addressing the future. I did have a reaction to it. First of all, I agree with you. Second, I thought it was an interesting choice. To the degree that this meeting had a cardiologist in it, and we were starting to talk about multi-metabolic issues. One of the presenting challenges is going to be to create a compelling rationale for doctors who are not hepatologists to start screening for fatty liver to understand how easy it is and how much sense it makes. So while that wasn't what I would have thought of as a science lecture, and in that regard, I think you and I are completely aligned, I think we're also aligned that it was a really good job of what it was, and that in the context of what the meeting was trying to accomplish, I understood why he did that. Absolutely. I think what he also did is if you look back at Oksana's presentation about NCDs, was link it in very nicely to you can do a framework around that. That allowed that uh, sort of roundedness of where you bring in other aspects if you look at where the conference and you can dip in and dip out bring in the strengths of where other sessions were there I, I can see how that can fit into that pathway and obviously I think it's cosmic is that the ne- the meeting in December with the trials mosaic but, um, mosaic, mosaic. It's got some of the same it. letters but- <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, I knew it was something. Uh, and again, during our session, in the end, he stood up and says, you know, I think um, we as a hepatology field are in the position to actually stand up and unite all these different disciplines and help them moving forward something that from his perspective, the cardiologists haven't been successfully done uh, to the same extent and that the endocrinologist and now the liver field and with all its oversight of the complete field, I think he's really in a position to move this forward. And I felt that was the very interesting message to me. And I'm very much looking forward to see how he fulfills this uh, position. And I think it led into your NCDs and, and the framework that we discussed the other week. There was something that you can see tying all together if we progress it. And I'd like to see that progressed because it sounds exciting. OK, so I didn't tell anybody what the closing question was going to be because I had three of them and I wasn't sure which one I wanted to use. But let's try this one. A one to three word description of your um, how you felt as this meeting wrapped up about the future and why you would choose that particular description. Oh, I'll jump in. I suppose the future's bright, the future's metabolic coordination, because that's where we're all leading to. If we can all get on the same page, our organs are all subject to a set of risk factors and we're just taking out the bit that we want. And this goes back to Donna's point. I don't care what I die of because once I'm dead, I'm dead. Just treat me as the person. We do need to get more person-centric and patients hold the key to that. And GLI, British Liver Trust, and Elpa and all of that. Lot. Excellent, Louise. Thanks. Next. Jeff stays quiet. So uh, following up with what I had said previously, um, hepatologists are trying to, in the absence of effective treatment outside of lifestyle changes, we're trying to really build the bridge with other disciplines, learn from them and move our patients in a direction where we can improve their outcome. And we're realizing that, of course, the liver is not there in isolation. We really got to partner with these disciplines. And I think that was an overarching theme in the, in the meeting that addressing multiple organ systems is the way forward. And it's through that that we can finally improve our patient's outcome and health. Okay, Jack. Well, Roger, you did say two to three words. And so I jotted down kind of the first things that popped to mind for me, which was humbled, blessed, and determined in that I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a hepatologist. I'm a patient advocate. And it's not unusual for me to be in these meetings and to be furiously on Google looking up the definition of some acronym that's been used only to look up and see all the hepatologists around me nodding their heads and and murmuring agreement like I'm at a, a country church on a Sunday morning with everybody saying amen and me having kind of missed the point because I'm trying to figure out what the what the acronym for the particular antagonist means but I think the thing for me coming out of Paris Nash in more than three words is that as a patient advocate you know I don't always catch up with the the details of the science. What I'm looking for is the experience of the science. And I can say wholeheartedly that the experience of the science that we had at the meeting, my experience of it was positive. I came into this with maybe three meetings prearranged and I didn't make it to every session because the end of the two days there, I ended up with over a dozen meetings with folks that wanted to talk and were excited about what they were doing and were really interested in what patients were getting organized and how patients could contribute or what point of view they may have on something. It's easy for me to get kind of get lost in the trees of the forest, if you will, of fatty liver disease and get caught up in the acronyms and the mechanisms. But at the end of the day, it's the experience, which is going to be something that we're going to value, that I feel really humbled and blessed to be able to be around smart people like Yarn and Dr. Senyal and you guys and keep working towards something that's going to put this together for liver patients and a, a brighter future for them. Well, so first of all, my friend, don't sell yourself short on the smart people concept might come from a slightly different direction, but I think the uh, quality and breadth of your insights is really pretty compelling. And again, I was going to say, Jeff, it's so important you are present and educate and remind us of the knowledge. Sometimes physicians just rumble away with their acronyms and talk outcomes and say, well, you know, we're going to improve this marker and that marker. And then the regular says, well, does that help the patient? And um, talking with the patient is what we got to do, right? So you're more than the most important person there are representing many patients. Yeah. And one of the nice things about you, and now, now if you blush, I'm sorry is that you have this unique ability to embody, encompass, and sort out multiple perspectives at the same time. So um, in marketing, we used to explain there is no such thing as the doctor, capital T, capital D. It's all about segmentation and diverse uh, levels of perspective and different combinations of perspectives. And you're pretty good at capturing a lot of those in your mind for, for whatever reason. It's just something you're good at. And I think it's a real contribution to everywhere you show up in this meeting, on this podcast, every time you and I ever talk, number one. The other thing you did that was interesting is you talked about a country church on a Sunday morning because the religious metaphor I had in mind was much more more 
Eastern, which is you can see the yin and you can see the yang, right? You can see the medicine going one way and the regulators and the payers going a different way and where the points of conflict were going to be and, and kind of how the tension was going to play out. And what all that left me is I won't say optimistic, but I will say hopeful because we need to have these discussions to know whether to be optimistic or not. I think the science gives us great reasons to be optimistic. I think the entrenched structure may be less so, but I like the idea that we're starting to have meetings, you're in Barcelona being one in a different way, this being another one, where all that interplay is happening and where we can start to figure out how to take these diverse positions and synthesize them into something that's going to work to the benefit of liver patients and others. The one thing that became clearer to me in this meeting than it's ever been before is that that's going to have to be, as Louise has been telling me since we first started talking to each other on LinkedIn three years ago, is that this is all about metabolic disease. At the end of the day, simply be, uh, Jeff Lazarus says the liver can't go it alone. I think this is clear. And what makes me hopeful is I think maybe we don't have to. With that, we will be back next week with a completely different cast of characters, except me to talk about the NAFLD Summit. Jeff, thanks so much for being able to join us from Paris tonight. And Jorn as well. And, and Louise, thanks. And condolences on the world's loss and on the raw motion to follow. Uh, I'll be back with Business Report in a couple of minutes. Y'all take care. Bye-bye now. And now for the Season 3, Episode 44, Business Report. Slava Ukraini, Hroyim Slava, glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes. It's been a remarkable week in Ukraine. What Ukrainians are teaching the world about courage, determination, and taking the long view are lessons our descendants will be studying for a long time to come. And while we're on the subject of current events, I would like once more to offer sympathy and condolences to the people of the United Kingdom and other subjects around the world on the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, a truly remarkable world leader. She's the only Queen of England for as long as I'm alive. And that's a while. And it will be fascinating to see how the world, A, acknowledges her gifts, which has been happening in droves all week, and then B, what of her legacy lives forward with Charles III and the world to come. By the time this posts, Roger will already be in Dublin. Okay, by the time this episode goes live, I'll be in Dublin for the NAFTA Summit. We will record our wrap-up episode Saturday afternoon, right after the summit closes down. Now, Louise will be attending virtually and will be unavailable on Saturday, and Jorn will be there in person. But he's living right at the end of the summit to spend a little bit of time with his family and young children in the middle of a brutal travel schedule. So they won't be with us. Instead, we'll be joined by Mazen Nordin, an experienced guest of the podcast, and two European opinion leaders I am delighted and honored to welcome to Nash Tsunami for the first time, Professor Sven Frank of the University Hospital in Antwerp, and Hannes Hackstrom of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Also, we'll have a post-event conversation with Louise and possibly you are that we'll record Monday night, and the episode we produce will be posted at its normal time next Wednesday evening. Downloads for Nash Tsunami are flat but strong, and rising tide is rising. Downloads hover slightly below the 2,000 per week level, a little lower than we had been, but still more than 50% above where they were at this time last year. Where things are picking up is for our Rising Tide and Diabetes series, the pilot, where episode three on drug choices will be posted by the time you hear this, and we've seen the hockey stick curve turn up in the way we hoped it would. Please come listen. Coming to you from the vault this week, an unusual episode. This week, we're replaying episode six from season three, which was part of the Nashtag wrap-up coverage. Our Nashtag panelists had so many interesting things to say about combination therapy that we decided to do an episode where I narrated tying their thoughts together. I thought it would make an interesting counterpoint to some of the thinking we discussed on today's episode about combination thinking in the mind of FDA and some of the other panelists and stakeholders in the game. I'll be interested to learn how fresh it sounds to you after eight more months of advice and reflection. And with that, I'm off. Thanks to the crew, Jack, Magic Mike, Eric, Steve, for getting all the stuff together while I'm up in the air. And more to the point, thanks to all of you for making this such a worthwhile labor to pursue. We'll be back next week with the NAFL Summit wrap-up. Until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website. <laughs>